Hey there. So on July 25th, the president of Tunisia froze the parliament, dismissed the prime minister, and announced that he was going to be taking firm control of the country, supposedly as a temporary measure. There is a tremendous amount of controversy over what to call this. After weighing it for a week, I am content to call it a coup or an auto coup, where a government official takes powers he's not entitled to. But more importantly, what I think we are seeing here is the collapse of Tunisian democracy. And the blame for this goes way back, long before anybody had even heard of Kais Saeed. I believe that Tunisian democracy in this form, the Tunisian constitution, was designed to fail. President Saeed argues that Article 80 of the Tunisian Constitution gives him the right to take emergency measures. I am no Tunisian jurist, but I have seen enough credible arguments that he has exceeded his rights under that article to call it a coup. For one thing, Article 80 says the parliament is supposed to stay in constant session during this state of emergency, and President Saeed has closed parliament down. Also, the Tunisian constitution calls for a constitutional court, but that court has never sat because its judges have never been appointed. This failure is the responsibility of the current Tunisian president and parliament, but it's also the failure of the previous Tunisian president and parliament. This court has never sat under this constitution, going all the way back to 2014. Many in Tunisia are celebrating the president's actions, at least so far, which is an indicator of just how far off the rails things have gotten. Even before the massive COVID wave that the country is currently experiencing, this government looked useless and incapable of doing anything. But the extremely high level of dysfunction that Tunisia has been experiencing since the presidential and parliamentary elections of 2019 may have gotten people to forget something very important. This system has never really worked. On July 25th, Kais Saeed dismissed his second prime minister, Hishem Michichi. Folks who think Saeed's masterly legal genius is capable of saving the country should keep in mind that Saeed appointed Michichi, a guy that he proved entirely incapable of working with. By the spring of this year, the Tunisian government had broken down almost entirely. But Kais Saeed is not the first president under this constitutional regime who couldn't work with his prime minister. It's been the same story ever since 2014. Saeed's predecessor, President Asebsi, fought bitterly with his two prime ministers as well. The crisis is much more apparent in this administration due to COVID, but this level of institutional failure and lack of attention to any of Tunisia's problems has been the case throughout this entire constitutional era. The truth is that Tunisia's constitution has never worked. Every country that has both a president and a prime minister handles the situation differently. Uh, how are each of the figures selected? Are they selected or are they elected? Which powers go to which political figure? It seems to me like most countries that have both make the president a more ceremonial figure and reserve the real powers for the prime minister. I'm not a scholar of constitutions, but I think the consensus is that Tunisia's system is especially bizarre. The president, who supposedly has fewer powers, is popularly elected and has to appoint the prime minister who is responsible for the day-to-day -day work of government. The prime minister has to be acceptable to the parliament as well, but it's odd that the president is as involved in this process as he seems to be. What makes it even weirder in the Tunisian context is the fact that from independence in 1956 all the way down to the revolution in 2011, the president was basically an all-powerful dictator. So you take that uh, cultural and historical baggage and add to it the fact that the president is now directly elected by the people and debatably has some kind of veto over the formation of the government but at the same time, he's not supposed to have any domestic political powers, it honestly doesn't make much sense. It's almost like it's designed to fail in ways that the elites can benefit from. Thankfully, the Constitution provides a mechanism to resolve any problems that a bizarre hybrid system like this is guaranteed to generate. 
You know, the constitutional court, the one that has never been appointed. Everybody, from the Tunisian public to outside NGOs, likes to vilify Tunisian politicians for failing to do this. The failure to formulate the constitutional court has been one of the main topics of Tunisian politics for the past six years. But when you look at how this is actually supposed to happen, this failure gets a lot less surprising. Rather than have one branch select the judges and then have another approve them, each branch is supposed to select four judges, and then all 12 judges have to be approved by the parliament and the president. It's a truly absurd contraption of a way to appoint one of the most important powers in the land. This system was designed to fail. And it has failed. Tunisia was applauded over and over again for the consensus that went into its constitutional process. Uh, back in 2015, a group of Tunisian civil society actors even won the Nobel Prize for their part in forcing Anakta, the popularly elected Islamist government at the time, to adopt this complete mess of a constitution. Uh, back before this spring, when I did a more intense study of what was going on in Tunisia, I too was part of this chorus of acclamation. In the first years after the Arab Spring, many countries looked to be embarking on serious experiments in representative government. Egypt got its first popularly elected president in 2012. Libya had elections in 2012 as well. Yemen never managed to have an election with more than one candidate, but its national dialogue process looked promising. All of these experiments now look like failures. Egypt's only democratically elected president died in prison, and he's been replaced by a dictatorship worse than the one that was toppled in 2011. Libya and Yemen have both fallen into civil war due to a combination of internal discord and greed, and savage external proxy warring and invasion. In 2013, it looked like Tunisia might be heading in the same direction a series of assassinations, an escalating protest movement, and political gridlock between secular and Islamist-leaning political parties looked like it might tear Tunisia apart. Instead, in 2014, a group of civil society organizations came together and arrived at an agreement that kept the peace. Tunisia achieved another five years of peace and democratic stability. It was a success. It did avert an Egypt-style coup. It helped bring about peaceful transitions of power in 2014 and 2019. But it also kept anybody in Tunisian government from being able to make any kind of real change at all. It brought about a peaceful but deadly stasis. A complicated government that never works won't offend anybody, but it can't help anybody either. After the 2011 revolution, there were a lot of unresolved questions. What about the old regime oligarchs that owned the whole economy? What about the security services that were implicated in human rights abuses? Those were the sorts of actors that might have used a fear of Islam to carry out a coup against Anatta in 2013. The 2014 constitutional process that made it impossible for anybody to use the Tunisian government to do anything, made the old regime actors feel safer and averted a coup and allowed the Tunisian democratic process to continue. But it actually did make those old regime actors safer, which was, in a way, a betrayal of the revolution. There were some exceptions, but most of the old corruption stayed. New political actors, including elements of Anakta itself, realized that the system was designed to fail, so they decided to join in on the corruption party. Tunisian democracy has failed. But it didn't fail on July 25th. It's been failing for years now. It may even have been failing since January 2014. What we're seeing now is a crack-up long foretold, and in many cases, long awaited. The euphoria is passing, and I now expect things to get pretty grim. It seems to me like every single Tunisian political actor believes that it's their opponents who are in bed with the old regime and share in the old regime's corruption. 
Or maybe your political enemies are the beneficiaries of funding from sinister outside forces. Depending on your politics, it could be the foreign evils of neoliberalism and Islamism, or maybe it's the evils of secularism and westernization. Everybody is convinced that the completion of the revolution requires blocking their political opponents from power. What makes this extreme political paranoia even more dangerous is that to some extent, it's all kind of true. Tunisia is a small country in a rough neighborhood with a plummeting economy and a political system that was intentionally broken in the name of consensus, peace, and nobody ever being held responsible for anything. Of course Tunisia's politicians are super corrupt. President Kais Saeed was elected and remains very popular today because of his perceived incorruptibility in opposition to the rest of the mess. I remain somewhat convinced of Kais Saeed's virtue. Kais Saeed is certainly convinced of his own virtue, but I also think he's got a bit of a messiah complex. Many accounts claim he's got widespread support, but I expect that to fade somewhat quickly. He's got incredible self-belief, and now he's got wide powers, but I don't see how he's going to satisfy anybody. It's especially difficult to wield one-man rule in a country where half the country's political world believes the other half belongs in jail. Very little of what he has promised is possible in the 30 days that Article 80 provides for. I expect his leadership to get more dictatorial and more long-lasting. Ironically, I have the sense that Kais Saeed is likely to disappoint the Tunisian street by not acting as dictatorially as it wants him to. Many of the Tunisians that I'd probably want to party with, the English-speaking, more secular, Western-facing folks, seem to want him to do a broad-based crackdown on Hanakta, the Islamist party, which is also the only political party that has a consistent democratic constituency over the past decade. Needless to say, I don't think this is a good idea. Hey, quick interjection to make something explicit that I left out of the script. I believe that Inakta is a key reason why Tunisian democracy failed, but not because of anything that Inakta did. I believe it was actually fear of Inakta that got a lot of actors who actually believed and were committed to Tunisian democracy to a degree to such a stupid constitution. The constitution keeps anybody from exerting any real power in Tunisia, and in a lot of civil society actors' minds, it importantly kept Enakta from exerting any real power. So that's kind of the original sin of Tunisian democracy, at least in uh, my very orientalist, western-oriented view. Um, but I wanted to say that explicitly instead of just leaving it out of the script. Thanks. Back to the script. Needless to say, I don't think this is a good idea, and I don't think Saeed is going to go for it either. Tunisia is not Egypt. What's more, Saeed uh, is reportedly a fairly conservative Muslim himself, which I think makes it unlikely for him to fall for the idea that all of his country's problems can be blamed on the Islamist party, the way that it seems like a lot of Tunisian Twitter wants him to. I'd like to close with a bit of optimism. It's very easy, coming from the Anglo tradition of centuries of unbroken wealth and hegemony, to throw a hissy fit when the forms of representative democracy are trampled upon. It might be instructive to remember that Tunisia is steeped in a more pragmatic tradition. Even before the imperialist invasion, Tunisia was closely associated with France. France is in its own way, a strong democracy, but it's not exactly renowned for institutional stability. The current French government is the Fifth Republic, and it only dates back to 1958. Some of the French republics have lasted as long as seven decades, but the second one only lasted four years. I think it's fair to say that after seven years, Tunisian democracy's second republic has failed. But that doesn't mean we should lose hope, as I pointed out back in 2019. So does this mean Saudi Arabia is right? Is Arab democracy impossible? Of course not. The Tunisians have proved that it is very possible. The fact that they've managed to keep going for the past eight years is an extraordinary accomplishment. It may all fall apart, but if it does, this period will serve as an example of what's possible, and it will inspire future generations. 
years. I think the next months or years or hopefully not decades will prove to be difficult ones for Tunisia. But they will make the advent of the Third Republic all the sweeter when it arrives. This version of Tunisian democracy appears to be dead. Long live Tunisian democracy. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. I'd be grateful if you considered signing up for my email newsletter as well. You'll get a free PDF essay if you do. Thanks.